Hundreds of refugees live crammed inside a mosque in the Albanian city of Kruma. Family members often lose each other in the confusion. Relief organizations are working to help these Kosovo refugees. When we return on DW TV. A few blankets are their bed for the night. The ones who got here first were able to find a place inside where they could at least sit. It's a bit warmer in here, and now and then, some food finds its way into the prayer hall. Families often lose someone in the mass of people, so a volunteer from the local community calls out a steady stream of names. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the mayor's office, some progress is being made. A few suitable locations are available. Proximity to roads, electricity, running water, and adequate distance from the border are the decisive criteria. From here to the main road, it's 1.5 kilometer. And from, from here, from this cross to the city, it's 5 kilometer. So all the road that means that it's 6.5 kilometers yeah. far away from here. Ah, this is the first thing. This is not Paisa. Where is Kuku? Yes, this What's is Kuku? Gole. This is Gole. Ah, this is ah, going this is out. Gole, bro. It's the mm. first one to it's the first one. one. What's come out of the meeting is this. The local authorities have suggested two sites for camps. Unfortunately, it's too late to look at them today. So we'll go and see them tomorrow. As for the possible location we saw from the air, the Swiss are already there. So we'll come back tomorrow and look at the two sites the mayor proposed. We'll check out the conditions and make a decision. Salil tries to make contact with his organization. The mayor has expressed a desire to help, but hasn't decided how or when. The next morning, the Unimog is in the camp near Kukas, ready for loading. CM Kuster is the driver. He knows how to get the 1,400 food rations to a UNHCR border camp some three and a half hours away. We leave Kukas heading north, past an overcrowded Kosovo Liberation Army barracks. The man at the wheel of the Unimog knows every inch of this route. CM Kuster's been working for the technical aid agency in Albania since September. He never thought the misery here would reach such dimensions. At this point, he says, there's no choice but to save whatever can be saved. All you have to do is take a good look at the situation. Somebody's got to help out. After all, Albania is the poorest country in Europe. Even without the refugee crisis, the country receives development aid. There's no way this country can deal with the flood of refugees on its own. The higher up into the mountains we get, the thicker the oncoming traffic out of Kosovo. CM Kuster says if the last few days are any indication, what we'll find at the end of our drive in the country is a border camp bursting at the seams. C. 
Maxim Kirster knows he'll be one of many drivers bringing back as many refugees as possible on his return trip from the border. Many private carriers swiftly realize the business opportunity in forced expulsions and human suffering. Uh, what are you bringing up here? Humanitarian daily ration. Roger that, roger that. Uh, I will just call Papa Charlie 9 because he's down there for the moment. I, I am at the border and he will uh, tell you what to do. Yeah. Okay, I will stand by. When we finally get there around noon, the Unimog driver isn't the only one who's surprised. Yesterday, this camp was jammed with people. Now, only about 150 people are sitting here waiting to leave. The Serbs have closed the borders again. Even so, the Norwegian worker from the UNHCR is happy to see the German driver and his shipment come in. There's no telling when more refugees will arrive. <laughs> But it looks very much better today. Being here this morning, just about to give up. We're close to an epidemic here. We have 800 people sleeping here in uh, in the garbage. Yes. Outside and the hospitals and everything is so dirty that close on everything. And all the local drivers has increased the price to a level that's half years wages. What, what's now the rate? First it was thousand dollars mark for eighteen kilometers. Now in the down on uh, fifty dollars mark. Ahead. No, no, no. For one trip into Kruma. For one truck, one trip. Albanian workers unload the German truck along with KLA soldiers. What's politically correct and what's not doesn't have much meaning up here anymore. Whatever the cost, the people want to get out of here and go wherever they think they might be better off. <laughs> By afternoon, the camp has emptied out noticeably. The journey continues, even for the ones who barely have the strength to take a single step. The aid workers give instructions to bring the old man to the camp in Kukas to join his family. Anyone who hears that a ride in the Unimog is free tries to get a place for themselves and their families. Here too, the KLA lends a hand. The alliances forged here are born of necessity. Some of the aid packages are distributed as travel provisions. CM Kirster heads back with his human cargo. He doesn't make the trip at night anymore. What never ceases to amaze him is the solidarity the Albanian people show for their ethnic brothers and sisters from Kosovo. 
I know of families, Albanian families of 12 people, who've taken in 40 refugees. You have to remember, an Albanian family with 12 people doesn't live like we would in Germany, in a house with 12 rooms. For them, things are usually pretty crowded as it is. Is it possible to get used to the things you see every day? It may sound strange, but you develop a thick skin. You have to. You can't and you shouldn't get completely wrapped up in it. It'll destroy you. And that's not going to help anyone. By evening, we've reached our destination. By the look of it, the chances are not too good that the families riding in the back of the truck will have a much better time of it here. Thousands of refugees are literally living in the dirt. The unhygienic conditions are a bad portent for the weeks to come. In spite of the desperate situation, the new arrivals are glad to be here. They're a good distance further away from the border, and who knows, maybe somehow things will get better. Siem Kerster finally has a chance to bandage up his sore foot. Tomorrow morning, he'll be back on the road provided his colleague from Cologne has been able to set up a new transit camp in Kruma. Soon the Italians will have eight water tankers in service. Each one holds 8,000 litres. They agreed to deliver us three tankers full of water per day. As long as we focus on concrete approaches, then we can think a lot more substantially about the situation and get done whatever we can get done. You mean you focus only on the ones you're able to help? Of course, otherwise we'd despair. Whichever borders were opened or closed that evening, there's still a shortage of basic necessities in Kukas. The big cargo planes on the runway the next morning in Tirana are some consolation. And another 707 is here from Germany. This time, the unloading goes faster. But in a crisis like this one, it's doubtful whether it will ever be fast enough. Some of the forces who are accused of driving ethnic Albanians out of Kosovo have been filmed leaving the province themselves. The Yugoslav government says it's withdrawing the majority of its forces from Kosovo, but these pictures are the only evidence so far, and there can be no certainty yet that it's really happening to any serious extent. John Simpson, BBC News, Belgrade. Hardly able to walk, this weakened old woman had no choice but to struggle on. For weeks she has been fleeing. Today, finally, she crossed the border into Macedonia. There was no rejoicing. This group was exhausted and still afraid. Just ten weeks old, baby Andy has known nothing but war. These people fled villages in central and southern Kosovo. They and other new arrivals say the Serbs are not pulling out, but digging in. The general information that I've got over the past days is that there's no, no sign of military retreat. Um, in fact, people actually, a uh, new military has been, uh, has been brought in. Uh, new wagons have been seen carrying uh, military on it. And there have been uh, accounts of uh, new military attacks on villages um, close to the, to the Serbian border. From the border, they were brought to the chaos of a refugee camp. They came with literally nothing. For three-year-old Ermal, there was a rare treat and a new sense of safety. Those who fled here in fear told us that Serb forces are still thick on the ground in Kosovo. Chamile says there are soldiers on every corner and in every village. I don't think we will ever be able to go back home. The soldiers are everywhere and they are never going to leave. They are inside every empty house. The war 
is behind them now, but for children like this little girl, life will never be the same again. All those here must make a new beginning in a country where they are simply not wanted. After their long ordeal, this is the end of their journey, at least for now. They're joining the masses in the heat and dust of a tent city. It's a place no one would ever choose to call home. Orla Gearn, BBC News, Stankovac Camp, Macedonia. Dice que lo peor para un refugiado es no hacer nada. Osmond Meisnol ha conseguido mantener viva su profesión en este campo de refugiados de Neprosteno, en el este de Macedonia. En la tienda ha montado un pequeño estudio y todos los días pinta durante varias horas. Incluso ha vendido un par de cuadros a un periodista americano. Osmond se queja, como otros muchos vecinos de tienda, de que durante las últimas semanas tiene serias dificultades para conseguir agua, comida y artículos de higiene personal. El ACNUR ya ha avisado, si su cuenta bancaria sigue en números rojos, los refugiados en Macedonia lo van a pasar todavía peor. Una llamada de atención a la que han respondido países como Canadá e Irlanda, que han realizado aportaciones suplementarias. Pero en algunos campos, como el de Nepróstheno, lo que falla sobre todo es la organización. El ejército alemán dejó de administrar este campamento de Nepróstheno hace tres semanas. Y todos los refugiados con los que hemos hablado coinciden al afirmar que desde entonces la situación ha empeorado. El gobierno macedonio ha dado un paso más para controlar lo que ocurre dentro de los campamentos. Hasta ahora su policía vigilaba el control de accesos y el perímetro. Y a partir de ahora también patrullará por el interior, sobre todo para evitar que proliferen las actividades políticas de los refugiados y en especial de los seguidores de Lucha K. Replicarán un año más tarde por un referéndum así formal que ilegal. A la cuestión, ¿voulez-vous retrouver votre autonomía perdida? 90% de los kosovars responderán sí, oui", una respuesta clara y net. A l'automne 1991, les Kosovars élisent leur propre président et leur propre parlement. La Ligue démocratique du Kosovo, la LDK, un parti modéré, gagne ces élections que Belgrade qualifie d'illégales. Son chef, Ibrahim Rugova, est élu président avec 99% des voix. La tâche de Rugova est difficile. Ce professeur de littérature, tout juste sorti de la tour d'ivoire des Beaux-Arts, tente de répondre à la violence serbe par la non-violence des Albanais. Dans un premier temps, les plus importants chefs de clan du Kosovo soutiennent sa politique. Très vite, Rugova est surnommé le Gandhi des Balkans. Les Albanais manifestent leur résistance pacifique en défilant tous les jours et en silence dans la zone piétonne de Pristina. Pendant que la guerre fait rage en Croatie et en Bosnie, les Kosovars attendent. Peut-être réussiront-ils à s'en sortir indemnes. Même dans leurs actions protestataires, ils essaient de provoquer les Serbes le moins possible. À cette époque, les Kosovars se chargent eux-mêmes de punir impitoyablement tout acte criminel perpétré par l'un des leurs sur un ou une Serbe. Sur les trottoirs, les Serbes se contentent de les regarder amers. Qui les a autorisés à bloquer cette rue Ce n'est pas normal. Ils arrivent peut-être à intimider certains d'entre nous, mais moi, je ne crains rien. Ici, nous sommes en Serbie et ils ne me font pas peur. L'avant-dernière apparition de l'adversaire de Rugova au Kosovo remonte à 1995, à une époque où la guerre en Bosnie prend une tournure des plus atroces. Grisé par les débordements d'enthousiasme de ses partisans, Milosevic joue le rôle qu'il sait le mieux jouer depuis son ascension au pouvoir, celui du tribun populaire dont le seul souci semble être de rétablir la paix. La paix, c'est ce dont nous avons tous le plus besoin. Et pas seulement au Kosovo, dans les anciens territoires yougoslaves ou dans tous les Balkans. La paix, un mot qui reste encore du domaine de l'abstrait. La même année, soutenue par les Occidentaux, les troupes croates chassent les Serbes Kraina de Knin. Près de 250 000 Serbes quittent la Croatie pour se réfugier en Serbie. Ils se sentent trahis par Milosevic. Lorsque les autorités serbes tentent d'en réinstaller des milliers au Kosovo pour renforcer la présence serbe dans la province, la plupart d'entre eux refusent. Ils ne veulent pas tomber de Charib dans Silla. Milosevic est ébranlé. 
Les extrémistes albanais pensent alors que le moment propice est enfin arrivé. Lucheka lance ses premières attaques contre les policiers serbes en 1996. L'armée renforce alors sa présence au Kosovo. Dans un premier temps, Ibrahim Rugova considère ces attaques comme des provocations serbes destinées à justifier le déclenchement du conflit. Il ne sait pas encore que le soutien à sa politique de résistance pacifique à Chari sont exécutés, uniquement parce que l'un d'entre eux faisait partie de Lucheka. La guerre au Kosovo entre ainsi dans une phase critique. Malgré cela, ou peut-être justement à cause de cela, Milosevic et Rugova se rencontrent pour la première fois le 15 mai 1998. À l'issue de l'entrevue, le chef des Kosovars déclarera que cet entretien avait été un premier pas vers un règlement du conflit au Kosovo. Mais Milosevic s'était joué de Rugova comme il s'était joué de beaucoup d'autres hommes politiques avant lui. Et Rugova ne sait pas encore qu'avec le massacre des Yachari, le temps de la non-violence est définitivement révolu pour les plus importants chefs de clan. Il existe une réelle volonté de trouver une solution pacifique à notre problème. Mais pour la ligne dure des Kosovars, les jeux sont faits. La crise cède alors le pas à la guerre. Faiblement armé, mal organisé, ne disposant pas de commandement clairement défini, Lucheka se sent pourtant assez forte pour défier le pouvoir serbe. Pour la police spéciale de Milosevic, bien armée et ayant bénéficié d'une excellente formation, cette troupe disparate et isolée ne représente pas un adversaire bien sérieux. Mais les combattants de Lucheka évoluent encore sans problème dans les forêts et les villages du Kosovo. Car la guérilla bénéficie du soutien de la population kosovare, humiliée depuis tant d'années. Mais là où passent les soldats serbes, plus rien ne repousse. Les villages albanais se transforment en bourgades fantômes. Exemple, Malichevo. Les Kosovars ont quitté leur village avant que l'armée n'arrive. Ici, pas de conflit armé, mais pillage et rançonnement. L'objectif des Serbes était apparemment de détruire les foyers des villageois et d'anéantir toutes leurs structures économiques. Une autre forme de nettoyage ethnique. Et c'est ainsi que se forment à nouveau les longs corps de réfugiés tels que d'autres régions de l'ex-Yougoslavie les ont connus auparavant. Des gens dépossédés de leurs maisons et de leurs fermes, contraints de vivre sans feu ni lieu, avec toujours la crainte de devoir fuir à nouveau. Souvent, ces gens n'ont pu emporter que ce qu'ils avaient sur eux. Depuis le début des combats, en février 1998, au moins 850 000 personnes ont dû quitter leur village. Pendant l'été et l'automne 1998, l'ONU essaie à maintes reprises de faire passer des résolutions visant à sanctionner la Yougoslavie. Un embargo sur les armes à feu est finalement décrété. Il ne fera pas même scier les belligérants. Toutes les autres requêtes évoquées au Conseil de sécurité avortent. La Chine et la Russie y mettent leur veto. L'Occident assiste alors impuissante à l'effondrement du Kosovo. La diplomatie continue de parler de progrès là où l'honnêteté voudrait que l'on avoue un échec. Et Milosevic réussit une nouvelle fois à tirer profit des intérêts divergents des Européens.